I'm talking about uh, Japanification. That's, of course, uh, an issue that in Africa is very far away. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to, to give the word to Akebe Okube. Uh, Ethiopia has been growing very fast. Many areas in Africa have had very high growth rates, not just over the last years, but this has taken, uh, this is, has been going on for a while now. Um, could you help us understand uh, what the current situation is uh, of this region, of your country in particular, and uh, uh, what the outlook is? What are the big challenges you are facing? <coughs> uh, thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, first, uh, many thanks for your congratulations uh, on the Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner or prime minister, which I believe is uh, a prize for Africa, uh, not just for, for Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has uh, been uh, navigating uh, an economic growth, uh, quite fast and rapid, but more or less also equitable growth. So for the last 15 years, the economy has been growing by 10.5%. And uh, in terms of shared growth, as an important indicator, average life expectancy has increased from 44 in 1991 to 66 uh, in 2016. This is uh, 21 years uh, increase in average life expectancy, which is on average twice uh, the Africa's average uh, uh, growth rate. Uh, this morning, I would like to talk uh, the broader picture. And my perspective will be from a policymaker's perspective, but from a developing country or a developing country, especially African perspective. This uh, topic is critical, and we could see two central issues here. The first one is the world political and economic outlook, and the growth of African countries or developing countries is going to be determined and influenced not only by the domestic uh, uh, policies, but also the broader global uh, outlook. So this is central for developing countries. The second aspect is the rise of China. And uh, this is quite critical, because we are in a sino-centric uh, global order. It's not a hypothetical issue. And China, for good or for bad, is an important and critical uh, player. Uh, so I will try to focus on this uh, bigger picture. Uh, some 200 years ago, the great uh, Napoleon uh, said, China is a sleeping giant. Let her sleep, for when wakes, she will shake the world. This was exactly 200 years back, and China used to be the largest economy between 1,500 and <coughs> 1820. And since then, since Opium War, China has declined its uh, power and influence while it was the largest economy during this period. And now we see the return of China in the global economic uh, outlook. So it's quite critical without exaggeration or without uh, alarmist uh, approach. We need to be realistic in the world that we are in. The first point I would like to focus is that uh, uh, since 2007, as Oliver indicated earlier, uh, the global economy is in a slow down mode. Uh, it hasn't yet been able to uh, be back. Uh, the growth rate, <coughs> which was observed uh, a decade back before the financial crisis. And, and this is quite worrying for developing countries because it limits what they can sell in global market. It limits uh, the growth uh, space they can have. Uh, and the most critical issue is uncertainty. And this is quite valid or uh, important in terms of investment. Since year 2007, for the last 10 years, FDI outflow, I mean, end inflow, has been more or less flat. 
uh, about 1% increase every year. And this compared with double digit growth of FDI uh, is quite, uh, quite uh, alarming issue uh, because African countries, developing countries need FDI for their uh, growth. I would like to highlight also that uh, the increasing inequality is a critical issue. The marginalization of developing countries and also the increase in equality, even with an advanced economy, is a time bomb that uh, shakes the stability of the economy as well as the political stability. I would also like to raise a third critical point, climate change. Climate change is a global issue that directly influences economic growth and uh, both developing countries and advanced economies need to bring this uh, uh, issue and, and give it uh, uh, centrality. In the last uh, 30 uh, years, between 1990 and 2020, uh, the carbon emission has increased by 50%. And by the end of the century, the uh, global warming will reach about three uh, degrees Celsius. So this is a concern. I think advanced economies as well as developing countries should be looking. On the second team, the rise of China, what I would like to highlight is the rise of China is a reality. It's not a theoretical or a, debil a debatable issue. China is a propeller of the global economy. 30% of the growth rate globally every single year in the last few years is generated by China. So it has a significant influence in the uh, global uh, economic growth. We have also seen China's contribution in global GDP is increasing. By year 2000, China's GDP was only about one trillion. And in 2020, China's GDP is reaching 15 trillion, which is 16% of global GDP. And 27% of uh, global manufacturing is concentrated in China. Uh, this gives a great impetus and in terms of influence in trade, in investment, and also in global uh, uh, order as well. And uh, we have seen significant improvement in the livelihood of the Chinese people, especially the contribution in terms of poverty elevation. And, and this is uh, linked also with the improving the well-being of uh, uh, global population. On the green economy, <clears throat> I would like to highlight this point. The Chinese are making critical advancement in this area. It may be debatable to say that China is focusing on uh, building sustainable environment, not from the belief that uh, uh, climate change is a major risk, but definitely what is critical is they are working that the current a strategy of consumption of significant material and the damage to the environment cannot be sustained. So they are looking at their competitiveness and uh, China is becoming uh, a renewable uh, super, superpower. China has now generates 700 gigawatt of renewable energy, which is equivalent to the combined generation of uh, renewable energy in the US, Germany, India and Brazil. Uh, and, and, and this is quite important in terms of building circular economy. So the Chinese effect, the China effect, and as a global public good is an important area we need to consider. The last point uh, I would like to focus is what is the implication of these uh, two critical issues, the global economic outlook and the rise of China. And here uh, my... Uh, perspective on this issue is we are aware about the increased protectionism and the trade war as uh, Oliver indicated earlier. However, what we need to say is there are two approaches uh, we may need to consider or two avenues. One is 
who gets a bigger share from the existing cake is one issue, and this is linked with the friction between China and the US or uh, among the advanced economies. However, there is a second way of looking at this issue. How can we make the pie bigger so that the economy grows faster, so that uh, prosperity could be ensured and we can, we can prevent uh, the looming crisis and recession? And, and it's absolutely critical that uh, uh, thinkers and policymakers consider that uh, the common uh, win-win position is going to be critical in, in our approach. In Africa, China is involved, is a critical player. It's one of the top four investors in Africa, along the US, UK, and France. Uh, it's the largest trading partner of Africa, and we could see the trade uh, volume increasing from 10 billion in year 2000 to 220 billion in 2014. And uh, it's also a major financier in infrastructure. These are quite critical, and we as Africans, we don't see this as a scramble for Africa. We are engaged with our traditional partners, with Europe, with the US, but Africa should also engage with China uh, and, and try to exploit what could uh, positively be generated. So in broad, again, we need to have a realistic optimism, uh, and I don't think there is a need for being alarmist, but we also need to focus on big powers and developing countries, I believe, should work on how to make the pie bigger and to see a win-win so that uh, humanity can be saved and uh, prosperity could be sustained. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. I, I was struck by a remark that Arkebe made about FDI. And I think that it links nicely to the points I made and, and maybe useful, which is, on the one hand, if you're a firm, you're reluctant to do FDI in another country because of the tariffs, uncertainty, and so on, so you're going to kind of pull back. At the same time, the fact that the interest rates are so damn low on you know, bonds of, uh, of, of major uh, governments uh, in, in, the, in, in advanced economies means that it is very attractive from a financial point of view to actually invest uh, in countries which have their act together, like Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that if we look at FDI, it's probably this tension between the two which determines whether there is FDI in a country or not. But clearly there are possibilities. Low rates are good for Africa, yeah. potentially. Actually, <clears throat> this is a, an important point. Uh, uh, Ethiopia had focused on attracting FDI the last uh, six, seven years in particular. And the prime focus has been on productive investment, especially in manufacturing. Uh, and between year 2012 and 2017, uh, FDI inflow increased by uh, fourfold. And uh, its share in uh, Africa's uh, FDI inflow increased from 1% to 10% of Africa's uh, FDI inflow. And in us, East Africa, it uh, increased from 10% close to 50% of FDI inflow. And, and, and it's true, as you indicated, that uh, this is an area we need uh, to tap. 